this one first. Okay. All right. Well, I, I feel very privileged to be able to do do what I'm about to do. Um, the night before last, Wednesday night, I attended a, a lecture over in the MU by uh, James Howard Kunstler. Anybody here go to that? Yeah? Okay. Um, if you missed it, uh, I can sum it up. Everything is ugly. Most of you are idiots, and we're all doomed. <laughs> and we paid him to say that. Uh, and how does he know this? He knows this by looking at the American, the built American landscape. Okay. Now, a strange coincidence. I remembered as a grad student at the University of Oregon in 1993, I had just bought Kunstler's first book, a uh, very uh, successful book, The Geography of Nowhere. And after class one day, I showed it to my major professor, who was an NFL fan. Okay. Um, I thought it was pretty fresh and edgy. I kind of liked his take, his crit critical take. Um, and uh, I remember exactly what, what Kenny said when I showed it to him. He said, oh yeah, another guy who hates suburbia. <laughs> and uh, I think I remember that moment. And I, I mean, this, this really did happen this way. This is uh, an urban legend. I, I remember that moment because it was one of those shifty moments in life. You know, when something kind of shifted in the way I thought about things, when everything looked a little bit different. Um, Kenny looks at the same landscape that James uh, Howard Kunstler looks at and tells us that everything is interesting, every bit of it is significant, and we can spend a lifetime learning from it. So, if you hang around Kenny long enough, which I was privileged to do from 1992 to 1995 when I was an MLA, MLA student at the University of Oregon, you begin to learn to experience the landscape as he does. And this is because Kenny's enthusiasm for, under, and for understanding cultural <coughs> landscapes, um, you know, the expressions of what humans do in the landscape, is contagious. And he exerts a very strong gravitational pull. He's not very massive, uh, but, but his gravitational pull is quite powerful. <laughs> Students from across the Oregon campus are drawn to his classes because of his reputation as a teacher. His classes include design studio courses, um, courses in the contemporary American landscape, landscape perception, landscape theory, landscape history, and <coughs> landscape films, and probably other ones since I left there you know, 12 years ago. The graduate students like I was are drawn to him because of his reputation as a mentor. <coughs> Academics and practitioners of landscape architecture, along with people from a great variety of disciplines besides landscape architecture, um, are drawn to Kenny either because they know him through his endless travels. I saw his calendar today. Um, his involvement with a diverse array of organizations or through his writing. Because Kenny is a prolific, a prolific author whose works include a great many journal articles in popular and academic <coughs> press, but also several books, including Colorado, Visions of an American Landscape. And then the next one, a book that I've used as a primary text in a course I teach on neighborhood, which is called Yard Street Park, um, The Design of Suburban Open Space, <laughs> and a book that was co-authored with Cynthia Gurley, who was also on my, on my um, master's degree. Um, Dreaming Gardens, another book, Dreaming Gardens, Landscape Architecture and the Making of Modern Israel. And then the most recent and the theme of Kenny's presentation tonight, which is called Defining Gardens, Making Gardens in Wartime. And so Kenny has many other accomplishments. If you the program, you see some of these um, or the posters. A few of special note, though, for eight years, he was uh, editor of Landscape Journal, the primary academic journal for landscape architecture. He's a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. He's a recipient of the Bradford Williams Medal and a recipient of a Graham Foundation grant. He's also a senior fellow at Dumbarton Oaks and an honorary member of the Israel Association of Landscape Architects. So, so, I've been looking forward to this moment for all the 12 years I've been here, since I left Oregon and came to ISU straight from there. And I, what I've been looking forward to is to be able to share him with all my friends here in Flyover Country. So please welcome our 2007 Elwood Lecturer, Kenneth Alpham. get this <coughs> Hang on one second. Sir. Hang on. 
always admire people who are just like English professors. You just talk. You don't need all the equipment. You just, you know, you have some papers with you. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Actually, while that's going on, First, what I wanted to do actually was, was congratulate all this. Not all of you were here for the, the first presentation of student award winners to congratulate uh, all of you. Um, actually, I was at the ASLA meeting in San Francisco last week where Grant got his student award. And actually, he was nice enough to show me his project in detail today. And uh, all of them deserve sincere congratulations. Um, I'm actually honored to be giving this lecture and to be in Iowa. Uh, actually, I love coming here. Um, I've been here before uh, several times, uh, but I love coming here for two main reasons. Um, first of all, on your faculty, you have several people I've known for a very long time. Uh, Mark Chittister, I began my teaching career at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana in 1974. Uh, and one of my first students in one of my first studios was Mark Chittister, who is a member of this faculty. Um, we had breakfast this morning, and he scared me with a horrifying fact, which is the fact that he's a grandfather, which is, you know, I can't have students who are grandfathers, because I just became one myself last year, so it's, that seems out of whack. Um, uh, Mira, who gave an announcement about the, the, the program in Rome, was a student of mine since 1980. I've been a regular visiting professor at the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, in Haifa in my first year there, Mira was a student of mine in her final year. Uh, and Michael, as he's told you, was a graduate student uh, in Oregon uh, a, dozen, a, a dozen years ago. Uh, honestly, these are three of the best students I've ever had. And I've been teaching for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and I'm particularly proud of the fact that they all decided to become teachers. Uh, and you are very, very lucky uh, to have them all. Uh, there's a second reason, though, that frankly is even more important to me. Uh, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I was born in the uh, first 10 years of my life in Brooklyn and in the suburbs of New York. My accent might give me away. Um, uh, but my father was from Anamosa, Iowa. Is there anyone here from Anamosa who wasn't in prison? <laughs> Which is obviously the only reason you know the town. Um, people in New York actually would know it actually because they met my father. Because if you met him within the first 10 minutes of conversation, he would have told you that he was from Iowa in this small town in Iowa. So I had this odd experience of growing up in New York, my mother was from New York, uh, hearing stories of growing up in Iowa that my father uh, actually loved dearly. So Iowa always became an important part of, kind of my heart, if you will. Um, he did go to the University of Iowa, very <laughs> um, but related to the earlier scholarship uh, discussion, when my father passed away, my brother and I endowed a scholarship in his name at Anamosa High School, I'm pleased to say. All right, now, hit which? Oh, God. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay, you're right. Thank you very much for the tech support in the front. <coughs> okay. All right. What you're looking at there is the, uh, the cover of my book. Uh, there is a story that goes with that. If anyone wants to hear it, I will, I will tell it to you later. But that's the, the cover. And actually, there are outside for sale. And I'll gladly sign all of them. Um, okay. The year was 1918 the fourth year of what was then known as the Great War. It had already claimed millions of lives. <coughs> Siegfried Sassoon, a British poet, and in fact, by that time, anti-war personage, met with Winston Churchill, who was the Minister of Munitions. And during this conversation, Churchill remarked to Sassoon, he said, war is the normal occupation of man. Well, Sassoon really wasn't very happy with that answer, that, the answer to that, quest, that statement, and he wondered whether Churchill had been entirely serious. So he went back to him, and Churchill then qualified that declaration with a remarkable caveat. 
and he said, war and gardening. Mm -hmm. You can think of that as the classic dichotomy of war and peace, but also as the poles of human experience, the poles of destruction and violence versus tranquility and creation. You're looking here at a bomb crater on the grounds of Westminster Cathedral in the Second World War that's been left intact and used as a kitchen garden. War is certainly the most extreme of human and environmental conditions. But what does it mean that during war and even wartime and, and even wartime environments, one can find gardens? Gardens created during war are examples of what I've termed defiant gardens. Gardens in deserts, in prisons, hospitals, highway medians, vacant lots, refugee camps, rooftops, dumps, wastelands, even cracks in the sidewalk. These are all defiant gardens. Well, what are they? What do they have in common? Defiant gardens are gardens created in extreme and difficult situations, whether they're social, environmental, cultural, or environmental. They represent acts of adaptation, though, to very challenging circumstances. But you can also view them from other dimensions as acts of assertion and affirmation and human resilience. You're looking here in the foreground a garden at a, a garden in a refugee camp in contemporary Chechnya. Typically, in the popular imagination, gardens are thought of as places of repose, a respite from the indoors, the city, civilization, and culture, and the garden represents the out of doors, the non-human, and the world of nature. They're desired, but they're rarely seen as essential. Psychologists and philosophers have been informed about the fundamentals of human behavior by examining people in extreme circumstances of deprivation and hardship. My premise is that in the same way, gardens in extreme situations might reveal essential aspects of garden character and especially garden meaning. Gardens are always defined by their context. Perhaps the more difficult the context, the more accentuated the meaning. In a remarkable book by a man named George Eisen entitled uh, Children and Play in the Holocaust, Games Amongst the Shadows, there's some instructive parallels. Play, like the garden, isn't something that we always take seriously. The fact that pleasure and joy and abandon uh, and innocence and freedom are often pleasant with play, with play disguises more profound facts. Gardens are often seen as a luxury or a frill, a pastime or a leisure time pursuit, but not as a basic component of human existence and culture. Ironically, the beauty of the garden may mask its deeper messages. In Eisen's examination of children's play in ghettos and concentration camps and wartime hiding places, he discovered that play was, in his terms, an enterprise of survival, a defense of sanity, and a demonstration of psychological defiance. Well, so too the garden. This, these soldiers here, this is in World War I, harvesting grain right next to that cannon. Gardens offer a promise of beauty where there is none, hope instead of despair, optimism versus pessimism, finally life in the face of death. If the Edenic ideal of paradise is found at one extreme, its opposite is found in the landscape of hell. Maybe the garden is at its highest pitch, perhaps highest when hell is near. Thomas Cole's great 19th century painting of the expulsion from Eden. Defiance, though, can also be versus environmental conditions. The extremes of climate or topography lack of soil, water, or even plants. This garden is found in the Sahara, in the desert in Algeria. Gardens are concentrations of meaning. So we might discover more about the depths of that meaning by examining the garden in its defiant guise and in looking at gardens in war. Excuse me. The terrain of war is the battlefield. In a sense, one can think of the battlefield as the antithesis of a garden, a dystopic landscape which offers no cover or pleasure but is laden with terror and death. A garden doesn't belong in a battlefield or fit into it. War is unfamiliar, unimaginable, insane, and appalling. Gardens are the opposite. They're familiar, comprehensible, sane, and pleasing. The sensory richness and pleasures of the garden contrast with the repulsiveness of war. But a garden can act as an escape, or it can be thought of as a form of counterattack. It can be a line of defense. It can be aggressive. 
Uh, the Scottish artist and garden designer Ian Hamilton Finlay, who just died a couple of years ago, noted he said, certain gardens are described as retreats when they are really attacks. So what are the implications of Churchill's statement about war and gardening? What of gardens in war? There are many kinds of defiant gardens, but I'm going to focus this afternoon, this evening, on a selection from those related to wars in the 20th century, and as we'll see, also sadly go up to the 21st century. The fact that gardens existed at all in these situations is remarkable and frankly, I think, inspiring. So we'll look at gardens of in the First World War built behind the lines of the Western Front, gardens built in Warsaw and other ghettos under the Nazis during the Second World War, gardens created by prisoners of war and civilian internees in World War II and World War I, and gardens constructed by internees in the Japanese American internment camps in this country during World War II. Gardens, as I said, are inseparable from their context. So what I'll do is kind of briefly introduce the setting and historical circumstance of each of these and describe a few gardens, as many more, created in each circumstance and then try to draw some general conclusions about garden meaning. Importantly, everything I'm going to tell you, my evidence for this and research for this, is based entirely on, first, on primary materials and first-person accounts. So every story I'll tell you is either by someone who actually made these gardens or directly witnessed them during their creation. It is all firsthand. These are all defiant gardens, in trenches and ghettos and camps, perhaps gardens, or an attempt to do something and make something normal in the midst of madness, to make order out of chaos, where the garden and the act of gardening was an enterprise of survival, a defense of sanity, and a demonstration of psychological defiance. Uh, many years ago, I discovered this remarkable stereo photograph. The title is uh, on the bottom, you see there, shelters with gardens behind in the French trenches. This, this single photograph actually started this entire line of thinking and research. So along this hedgerow, you see soldiers standing behind their dugout. They've emerged almost like cave dwellers out from the earth to create gardens. The garden here was created amidst the world of trench warfare, a world of labyrinthian horror, one that became a charnel house and often a tomb. The act of creating any garden in this circumstance seems almost miraculous. But what were they for, who made them, and why? The gardens were many things beyond sustenance. They offered soldiers a way to control something in the midst of chaos. They represented home and hope. What you're looking here is an aerial photo of the trenches of the Western Front, the dark kind of big arc there is the land of no man's land between the opposing forces. Gardens are inseparable from their context. So to understand the gardens of the Great War, it's necessary to come to grips with a landscape that's incomprehensible. It was a place of horror that had the look and feel of hell. This is the battlefield of the Somme, one of the kind of scene of some of the most horrific fighting, not just in the First World War, but in human history. This was a landscape devoid of life, a battlefield terrain transformed by the modern technology of war. No man's land that you're looking at here separated these opposing forces, was a ruptured earth, a defoliated landscape of exploded trees, bomb craters, um, the bodies of beasts and corpses of men. It contained the sights, the sounds, and the taste of death. The world was dis disfigured, yet this unnatural world, this Frankenstein fabrication, was in fact a human creation. A painting by Paul Nash, a British painter, Brit official British painter of the war. In a supreme irony, the most conventional and prosaic of landscapes, a garden, was a rare and shocking sight for soldiers. But still, in the midst of these horrors, gardens were create, created, and it's hard to imagine that they were made at all. So here, this December 1914 photograph shows a soldier from the London Rifle, Rifle Brigade in front of sandbags that you see here, and his dugout, the blasted trees in the background, and you see this small vegetable garden. British soldiers gave familiar names to their dugouts and trenches. This is from the Illustrated London News in 1915, and it was entitled A Villa Garden on Regent Street. And you see the name Regent Street there. A key street in central London. Uh, this one was a more romantic version uh, here, which was entitled Beauty and War. And you see these soldiers here. One guy's holding up a puppy 
um, another person is kind of planting. There's some tulips there. The tree overhanging is, you know, it is springtime. And clearly this was a bit for propaganda uh, purposes. But later that year, the same magazine carried photographs, in fact, of gardens and transformations of the German trenches on the opposite side of the line, entitled here, Landscape Gardens, Gardening in the German Lines, which showed rustic woodwork. At camps, it was commonplace to create insignia of regiments and units using whatever material was available. So you see here this kind of this sunken parterre in the tents beyond. I love this photograph. You have the officers all kind of like standing there, you know, like not doing, you know, you know supervising the enlisted men who are doing all the work. Some battalions even sponsored garden competitions. Farther behind the lines, battlefields merged with the surrounding agricultural countryside of villages and fields. Former battlefields were reclaimed and returned to fields even as fighting still raged. So this soldier's planting celery in an old trench. The war is still on. The front is just about two miles away. Okay? A garden could be a combination of the task of the moment and a hope for the future. What we often think of as leisure or even killing time in peacetime in war could be a profound respite. These are two Australian soldiers in a field of wildflowers. This image is a garden in the prison of the Warsaw Ghetto. In the spring of 1942, a few young children in the orphanage of the Lutsch Ghetto, which was the second largest ghetto after Warsaw in Poland, turned a piece of forlorn ground into a garden. Their teacher, Sylvia Glaswiener, tells in her memoir, she said, when the children of the Lutsch Ghetto whoops, sorry, were deported, a spontaneous fury seized them. They went to their gardens and in a burst of anger, trampled the few beds of beets and ripped up everything that was growing there and they screamed, nothing will grow after we're gone, nothing will bloom in the garden. They had no one to cry out to. In a moment of their pain, they turned on the earth for it had failed them. They loved it, nurtured it, and watched over it. I think it's impossible for us to imagine the emotions of those children, but in deliberate defiance, they stamped out what they intuitively knew the garden represented which was hope and life. As it was extinguished, so too would be their lives. Gardens in the ghetto. It seems a preposterous yet amazing proposition. How were they possible? But there were gardens in the major ghettos of Warsaw and Lutsch and Kovno and Vilna. And gardens, like other aspects of life in the ghetto, that we might consider normal. Going to school or a park or a concert, praying, taking a walk or having enough for dinner, were in fact all present in the ghettos, but only through extraordinary human effort. The life of the ghetto gardens, like the ghettos themselves and their prisoners, were short-lived. But during their brief existence, gardens were attempts to create the conditions for survival. They were mechanisms of resistance to the horrific conditions under which people lived. They offered work and relief and solace and food and they were acts of hope and defiance. The Nazis invaded Poland in September of 1939 and immediately imposed their anti-Semitic statues. statues. Warsaw was the largest Jewish city in Poland with more than a quarter of a million Jews, about a third of the city's population. The ghetto was created in October of 1940. It was about 1,000 acres originally. Originally that entire blue area with the dash line and then gradually contracted into a compressed city of a half a million people. In this place, people were falling dead in the middle of the street. But an alternative life existed parallel with omnipresent horrors. There was the long Eastern European Jewish tradition of community self-help and organization that was both pragmatic and altruistic. So there were organizations that responded to the most practical necessities and critical necessities of food and clothing and shelter as well as desires for education, the arts, and culture. And if you think of it, gardens are one element that straddles both those basic needs and if you want to think of those kind of higher and artistic needs in society. You're looking here at the vegetable garden of the summer camp of the children or orphanage um, in the ghetto by a man, uh, run by a man named Janusz Korszak. He became very, he was actually a very famous educator uh, before the war and wrote a memoir and kept a diary and when all of these children were deported to Auschwitz, he actually walked with them into the gas chambers. 
All these organizations were activities that were directed towards the survival of the community and resistance to German policies. One organization that continued its pre-war mission and activities was the TOPAROL, which was the acronym for the Society to Encourage Agriculture amongst Jews that had been founded in 1933 to train Jewish agricultural workers. This is a group of these individuals in 1938 uh, at their farm just outside of Warsaw in a kind of beautiful display of their produce. But in the ghetto, ghettos, Toporol acquired land and seeds and equipment. They raised funds, they mobilized and trained workers, and they created gardens in any vacant parcel of land that they could appropriate, in courtyards, even on balconies. They built glass houses as well. They had bylaws. In their bylaws, they wrote the following. We are to instill in the children an aesthetic appreciation of their surroundings, direct their attention to growing plants that might bring them closer to nature and provide them with aesthetic experiences. This is in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942. It's important to note, however impressive their activities, like virtually all ghetto actions of survival and resistance, the efforts were valiant, the results meager. But the gardens are nonetheless inspiring. Of course we'd expect people who were starving, being systematically starved to death, to plant vegetables as they did, but they also planted flowers. Toporol planted gardens in over 200 courtyards in the ghetto. This is in one of them as part of a school as well. In the Lutch ghetto, a man named Oscar Singer, who was one of the historians of the ghetto, found he said every inch of soil has been planted with vegetables but he, he describes that only in the rarest cases was the ground prepared, and he describes people who were being worked today essentially as slave laborers during the day being reduced to skin and bone and then having the energy to work in the garden in the evening, and he described having a watering can as almost a luxury item in the ghetto. In the Lutch ghetto in the summer of 1944, starvation was rampant, and there was a series of gardens, there was a almost rural area that was in the boundaries of the Lutch ghetto where individuals had farmed, got, gotten pieces of land by lot, and essentially farmed them. A man named Roman Kent uh, and his fellow gardeners, and I interviewed him and he told me this story, described the fact how one evening starvation was so rampant that the people in the ghetto literally descended upon the gardens and pulled up everything that was growing there. Just everything that was growing there. And then he described how he and his brother who made their garden kind of sat in the middle of the field just sobbing and crying both for the kind of loss of that produce, but also with the knowledge that if people could wait another day or another week, there literally would be more food for individuals. He describes these gardens as a lifeline to life, essential to his family's survival. Okay. There's a common fascination with gardens that are uh, created in unexpected places, uh, where the location is unconventional or, ima or imaginative. In the Lutch Ghetto, there was an individual who created a garden in a baby carriage. Um, and he, there was in a baby carriage so he could guard it and protect it, and every day he moved it just outside the window where he was working so he could watch this and watch his plants grow. As the Nazis invaded, uh, took power in Germany, the persecution of Jews pervaded all aspects of life. Even before restricting habitation to the ghettos, Jews were forbidden to enter and use public open spaces. Given the horrific conditions, of the ghettos of Eastern Europe, the loss of a park or a garden might be seen as a luxury. But the desire for some contact with the natural world and a quest for the restoration of some semblance of normalcy represented in the common landscapes of garden and park was critical. The boundaries of the Warsaw Ghetto that I showed you earlier were deliberately drawn to exclude two parks that were immediately adjacent to that park, the ghetto in Warsaw. Uh, I interviewed a man named Jan Jagielski, who's the photo archivist of the Jewish Historic <laughs> Institute in Warsaw, and he said people had what he called fantasy gardens. And what did he mean by that? He meant that people would go on the rooftops of buildings that were adjacent to the wall of the ghetto and look out over towards these parks um, and imagine both the life they had before the war and the life they wished they had uh, after the war. This is the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto as it was destroyed right after the uprising in the spring of 1943, the lone tree you see there on the right was in one of these parks. The wall just went just to the left of that. 
There was armed and active resistance to the Nazis, most dramatically in the uprising of 1943, but there were innumerable acts of what have been termed spiritual resistance. You're looking here at the garden of the uh, ghetto hospital uh, in Lutsch, being worked on largely by the doctors, in fact. The slogan of Jewish communal activity in the Warsaw ghetto was, live in dignity and die in dignity. How does one sustain and even enhance one's dignity? How do you remain fully human? One way is through cultural continuity, honoring and even reasserting the habits and traditions that have served you well. Garden creation was only one of such actions. It could serve as a psychological protection from harmful forces, an assertive action to preserve life and dignity. We use the term morale most often in association with soldiers, but all of these civilians were combatants in the war against the Nazis. The garden can help your spirit. It could also be good for one's morale. This is the scarecrow in that same garden, complete with a yellow star. What is heroic? Actions that transcend the normal range, that confound our expectations, that take courage, where people overcome danger and fear. These were heroic gardens and gardeners. This image is a drawing done by a German POW at an American POW camp. He was captured at the Battle of the Bulge. He was a prisoner in an American POW camp in France in, uh, in 1944. Armies have always taken prisoners. We, they capture soldiers as well as innocent civilians. POW camps are typically miserable places with people suffering physical privation from hunger, disease, housed in often horrible conditions, and kind of under kind of psychological trauma, as we know too well these days. Um, the <coughs> image you're looking here is from the Changi prison camp in Singapore. The painting is by a very well-known Australian painter named Murray Griffin, who was imprisoned by the Japanese here during World War II. For prisoners, combat's over, but a war continues, but one now against disease uh, and brutality and boredom and despair. It's a battle for survival that takes great courage. The term barbed wire disease was coined in World War I to explain the psychological conditions that afflicted most POWs. The question everyone would suffer, the question was only one of degrees. People found ways to adapt to their circumstance, and some to maintain their sanity, and some even to glean something positive from the circumstance. Perhaps the war's most stunning example, this is the First World War's stunning example, of social organization in a POW camp was Rulabin, which was a civilian internment camp for uh, British and Commonwealth civilians outside of Berlin. In this very heterogeneous group of about 7,000 men, all from different parts of the British Empire, they organized themselves as a community. This was an area they described as Trafalgar Square. This is the cover of their camp magazine. And in this camp, there was both a formal and informal educational network. There were numerous lectures on all kinds of topics, and there was a very active garden club, which you paid dues to, and it had almost 4,000 members amongst the 7,000 people there. And gardening proved to be one of act many activities that helped people survive the place psychologically. It was gardens are, in a sense, a natural antidepressant and therapy for barbed wire disease. And eventually, the camp took on certain characteristics of an English village. It was built in an old racetrack, and this was the infield of the racetrack, the plan of their rather kind of immense vegetable garden that they planted there. They even had competitions. They had bylaws. They had officers. It was amazing. The British could be absolutely wonderful. Um, they established a chapter of the Royal Horticultural Society, okay? And they gave kind of awards for things, and they would like best barracks and best vegetables and biggest this and so on. My favorite one was they gave an award for the best boutonniere. Some of you don't even, you're not even laughing because you don't even know what a boutonniere is. Boutonniere <laughs> is the flower you stick in your lapel, you know, which you may have worn at your prom and so on. They gave, you know, people used to do that, okay. Before my time, of course. <clears throat> You're looking here at the journal of a C.I. Rolf, his journal from Stalag Luft III. He was imprisoned by the Germans from 1940 to 45, at least for what the British and Americans is probably the most famous POW camp. This was the camp from which the Great Escape was attempted. 
and this is the plan of his garden that you see there. Uh, last year, I was giving this talk at the North Carolina Arboretum, and I met a man named Dr. John Creech. Um, those of you who are horticulturists may know the name. At one time, he was director of the National Arboretum. And Dr. Creech told me his story, which was in, uh, during the Second World War, he was an American soldier in North Africa. He was captured by the Germans, sent to a POW camp in Germany, then another POW camp in Poland. At this camp in Poland, there was a derelict greenhouse. He was a horticulturalist by, by training and background. He convinced the German authorities to allow him to uh, kind of restore and reclaim the greenhouse. They got seeds from the Red Cross and the YMCA. They grew food that literally helped pe keep people alive. And then Dr. Creech told me he thinks he's the only American soldier he knows. He actually won the Bronze Star for gardening. Okay? And in 1946, he wrote an article, and this is the article, it was in Better Homes and Gardens entitled, I Gardened for My Life. Okay. In February 19th, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 that authorized the establishment of military areas from which any or all persons might be excluded or deemed unnecessary or desirable. Essentially, it was demarcating an area in the American West, west of that dark line there, which was directed primarily at 120,000 Japanese Americans who would be interned largely for the rest of the war. These individuals were to be relocated to internment camps in remote areas of the American West. And the major camps there are the triangles you see there on the map. The Japanese American population was rounded up and temporarily housed first in a series of assembly centers, which were in fact largely racetracks and stables places designed obviously for animals and not people. People were shocked and even bewildered by their incarceration and treatment by, the gov uh, by their government. By the way, about 70,000 of those individuals were full American citizens at the time. But the evacuated population responded in ways that brought to the four elements of cultural identity. Minnie Akubo was a graduate student in fine arts in Berkeley at the time and uh, began to keep a journal, and this is one of her journals showing its place at one of these kind of temporary assembly camps, and you see the gardens that individuals immediately began to create. But most of these camps were in remote, windy, dusty, wind-blown sites, unbearably hot in the summer, freezing cold in the winter, devoid of veg vegetation that residents described as a scorching hell, but one that was man-made. But this did not stop people's actions at trying to make places livable. You're looking here at the plant of Manzanar, which was not the largest, but perhaps the best known camp. It's in the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountains in, um, in California, in the Owens Valley, not that far from Death Valley. About 10,000 people were interned here. Internees were given this empty frame, which they then proceeded to modify to their specifications. They created complete open space systems. They created gardens for families and entries to barracks. They created gardens at recreational spaces, at mess halls and fire breaks and community parks. And they were rather incredible. This, this is the garden at uh, Manzanar's Block 12 that you see here. This is the plan of that same garden. The National Park Service, Manzanar is now a National Historic Site, as of several years ago. Uh, and the National Park Service did a kind of remarkable eight-year-long archaeological survey of Manzanar, and they discovered there were gardens everywhere in front of every barracks where people were dwelling, every mess hall where people uh, ate their three meals a day, the temples, the churches, the judo halls, there were gardens uh, everywhere. Um, this is about 100 feet long, by the way, this kind of stone and water garden. At a certain point, individuals were allowed to leave camp and use, in fact, the surrounding environment as their nursery, and this is at the uh, Topaz Camp in Utah, literally going out into the landscape and bringing trees back for gardens. Or here, a series of ironically named Victory Gardens uh, at Manzanar. Manzanar, though, was home to a large group of professional gardeners, a fact that I wouldn't expect people in the Midwest to know. But before the Second World War, along the cities of the West Coast, uh, Vancouver and Seattle and Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, the largest group of gardeners and kind of landscape designers were Japanese Americans. So you had a group of individuals who were incredibly skillful and now brought to this place, but a remarkably alien environment from what they knew on the far west coast. 
The building at this garden at Block 22 in Manzanar took on almost a legendary status because to build this very elaborate water garden and stone garden, they needed ample cement, but they, in the, they were only permitted to use three sacks of cement at a time for any project. So they kind of took the paperwork and kept forging it and bringing it back and forth, and they finally ended up with 24 sacks of cement uh, to build this garden. But then locally, it was known as the three sack pond. <laughs> at Manzanar, the site that was most photographed by visitors such as Ansel Adams, who photographed it, Dorothea Lang, as well as Toyo Miyataki, who was the camp photographer, was this place, which was Merritt Park. It was about an acre, a densely planted place with ponds and islands and bridges and waterfalls and tea house designed by the Nishi brothers, who were the two individuals in the center of that. Garden making in the camps was a domestication of an inhospitable environment. This was home, but of an indeterminate occupancy. People did not know how long they were going to be interred. Internees worked to create a cultural setting that fostered some semblance of normalcy under abnormal and unjust conditions. Gardens offered the dignity of work, opportunities for the expression of individual creativity and cultural identity. The beauty of the gardens offered solace and a contrast to this alien environment. All of these gardens, this was Manzanar's sole lawnmower, all of these gardens, grand and small, were acts of resistance directed towards the maintenance of cultural integrity and self-respect. They were tangible symbols of hope that helped people survive their internment. They were demonstration of psychological and also political defiance. You can think of these gardens as the anti-camp, a subversive response to internment, an individual and collective gesture of a way of denying camp administration and environment. These were great American gardens. All of the gardens I've just shown you were short-lived. None of them, of course, existed even for only short periods during the war, let alone after. But their brief duration is not at all proportional to their meaning. In fact, their brief lifespan may accentuate their significance. And I think this might be true for all gardens. When conflict ended, what was the fate of these war gardens? What are the places like now? Gardens are ephemeral, and if, if you think about it, it's very rare for any garden, anywhere, to outlive its initial maker. This was a 1917 wartime photograph, and it was captioned, where pastoral, pastoral peace once more reigns in a fiercely contested battlefield. Um, we visited the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, my wife and I, in the spring of 2004. I was born three years after the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was quelled and the ghetto turned to rubble. I knew the history and the site from reading and maps and photographs, I knew that nothing remained. Everything you see there was after the war. The trees, the buildings, kind of you know, Soviet block housing, essentially. But I still looked in vain for something, a fragment, a remnant. It takes an act of imagination when you're there to replace the scenes of these blocks of houses with the images you know of crowded streets and courtyards and people dead in the street. I know I'm stepping on ground where thousands died. The sidewalk I'm walking on is where people stepped over starving children and around dead bodies. I know that here soldiers rounded up families. I know that death was rampant. And I know that the full spectrum of human emotions happened right here. Unthinkable horror, acts of unimaginable courage, and the loss of all faith. And I also know that on this ground, a few people planted seeds to grow food to keep people and their hopes alive. And I know that few survived and that fate was random. The last two photographs, this one and the previous one, are on the exact site of where gardens were in 1942. And this is one of the three remaining remnants of the uh, wall that surrounded the Warsaw Ghetto. In this country, the camps were demolished, the buildings relocated, the land abandoned, but remnants remain. Um, the National Park Service has actually excavated a few of these gardens at Manzanar. You're looking at one of them now, and as you walk through <coughs> The grounds of Manzanar, you see things everywhere. You see deliberate arrangements of stones, depressions that were pools, trees that were clearly planted a half century ago, things rusting and slowly decaying in the desert. Nature always returns and eventually obscures the evidence of human action, even of the most horrific kind. It may be rapid, a season, or over generations, but eventually culture becomes compost.
These defiant gardens may seem out of place, but paradoxically, upon careful examination, these gardens reveal themselves to be supremely adapted to the specifics of their situation. They astonish us by their presence and the recognition of their creation. Gardens embody a paradox. We associate gardens with nature, but they're a prime manifestation of our dominion over the natural world. In an uncontrollable situation, war or people under extreme stress, the manifestation of the human ability to have power over something must be potent reminders of the ability to be in control and not yield to forces of chaos or emotional despair. In the dehumanized circumstance of war, these reconfigurations of nature are reminders of our basic humanity. Well, I think the meanings and the associations and the lessons of studying gardens and war are many. But from looking at these gardens created during these kind of horrors, five deceptively simple themes arise. Gardens whose meaning and significance is in terms of life, home, hope, work, and beauty. Gardens are alive, their connection to home, they embody hope, their places of work, and their sites of artistry. These are all, of course, commonplace themes, but the meaning of each is magnified by the context of war and a defiant response to conditions. The gardens speak to us. They testify to a depth of meaning amplified through these hardships, a meaning, I think, that might lie latent in all gardens, just awaiting a catalyst to bring it to conscious awareness. Um, I like to think of it this way. Many of us have had uh, a friend or a relative whose company we appreciate and we find them congenial, but they then respond within kind of uh, unexpected aid or depth of compassion in a crisis. I think gardens and our relationships to them are like that. Their gardens are our comfortable companions, but they have capacities that lie dormant, awaiting a crisis to release or activate their potential. So briefly, these five attributes, life. Nature is alive, and as human beings, we identify with its vitality. We have an innate affinity for the natural world, what E.O. Wilson calls biophilia. The products of the garden sustain us with food for our bodies and food for our psyches. In war, the implicit connection to life forces inherent in nature becomes explicit, for death is omnipresent and the fragility and preciousness of life immediate. A man named George uh, Topas, who was a Warsaw native and a Toparol instructor for which he was paid a loaf of bread a week, described an incredible contrast of working in the ghetto and corpses being dumped into mass graves on one site and immediately opposite that his students uh, who he was training working in gardens. Uh, actually, these individuals are growing cabbage in a place that did become a site of mass graves in the Warsaw Ghetto. What happens when nature is systematically removed from one's daily life? We have deep attachments to places we call home. This little illustrated poem entitled Haven is by a New, New Zealander soldier who was imprisoned in Poland during World War II. And it's clearly an image of kind of imagining his home uh, back home or his imagined home back in New Zealand. Gardens may be part of our home or reminders of homes we've inhabited. Gardens can act as mnemonic devices, recalling places. Gardens are a form of domesticating space. So Japanese American evacuees took what was a vacant canvas and made it their home. Garden making was a way of taking possession through labor and design and creativity and their cultural signification. For people who'd just been dispossessed, this was particularly important. In all the camps in America, meetings, all, the, one, the rule was all meetings and publications had to be in English. In a sense, garden making was a way of speaking one's language, using one native, native's tongue, a way of asserting one's Japanese heritage. This is the Minidoka camp in Idaho. You see the edge of the camp there, you see a Torai gate to the right, and this was an area, this little kind of picnic area, which they call the wildlife preserve just at the edge. In Minidoka, a Mr. Nita bonsai the sagebrush, okay, that you see there. His action domesticated that wild, his wild plants, but also, in a sense, made it Japanese. Minidoka had many skilled designers, but the story and fate of the Kogita Garden uh, is fascinating. Before the war, Yasusuke Kogita, who's the individual on the far left here, had elaborate gardens in Seattle at his home and work. 
In Minidoka, he scoured the landscape for materials, at one point even bringing back a one-ton rock, and created a very elaborate stone garden that his children described as it became part of him and as a way of, of making his way through this experience. At the end of the war, rather interestingly, the US government then actually paid the ship back your possessions back to your home. Generally, there was nothing when you got back home. Mr. Kogita was very smart. He had them ship his garden back. <laughs> he literally wrapped the stones, and the US government paid to send them back. Okay? And he reconstructed his garden back at his home in Seattle. These are his sons who were interned as young children there. After he died, the stones from that garden now lie in Paul Kogita here on the right, in front of his house where they are family heirlooms. Or here in a garden created by Italian prisoners of war in Australia in World War II, where they created a model of the Colosseum in the middle of that. Okay, which so don't forget to go to the Rome exhibit right after this. Or here, American soldiers in Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War created, these pictures were given to me, I was not there, by a man who was a, uh, actually an a, a Air Force surgeon. And he described the encampment there in the desert of Saudi Arabia. There were 500 tents, 10 persons for each tent. It was like a Roman military encampment. He said within two weeks, in the front of every single tent was a kind of garden or yard um, created here out of remarkable ingenuity of whatever materials you could have tarps and sandbags and projectiles and cones, um, and clearly a, almost a kind of caricature of an American streetscape, but a desire really to create something that was a reminder of home. Gardens take time to conceive and make and develop and grow. And since time immemorial, cultures have wondered at the biological miracle of a seed that's planted in the ground, emerging out of the darkness of the earth into light and life, and hope is embodied in that transformation. This is actually my favorite tree, which is the Iolanthus altissima, the tree of heaven. It was a tree that grew in Brooklyn. Um, others consider it a weed tree. I think it's a great plant. <clears throat> hope is preparation for the future. Hope is not naive optimism. Hope has habits of persistence and resourcefulness and courage. Soldiers hope not to be mortally wounded. They hope to survive. They hope for peace. The soldier's primal fear of death if fear is death and a return to the earth. A garden, especially any plant emerging from the ground, is a sign of regeneration and life emerging. I've read uh, soldiers' diaries from the First World War where they speak of seeing literally a leaf or a single blade of grass in no man's land and what it meant to them. Several years ago in New York, I sat in a library listening to a woman named Esther Mishkin, and she described vividly the events of 60 years earlier in the Kovno ghetto. She described the garden that her father had built in the ghetto. And I asked her, I said, did you work in the garden? And she said sometimes, but she added it was really her father's. He adopted the whole thing. And then she described the fact of she watching her father watch the garden. And then she said about, the, about that, that he used to just like to watch the garden grow because it gave him the feeling that something's growing, that we could survive somehow. His wish was fulfilled only for his daughter. She was the only surviving member of the family. There's a distinction between a garden as a refuge and a garden as a respite. The garden as a refuge suggests that it can function as a sanctuary, a place sheltered and protected from outside forces. A respite's only a temporary material or psychological sanctuary. It can offer an opportunity for calm, a change of mood, even temporary forgetfulness. In the ghetto, gardens were only respites. They could alleviate despair for only short periods of time. But that does not lessen the significance of those moments. Gardens conform to the expected cycle of seasons of growth and life. The garden's a demonstration of life in order, not a world turns upside down. Nelson Mandela, in his autobiography, A Long Walk to Freedom, speaks of a garden that he nurtured in his long years of imprisonment on Robben Island, and he's very explicit about what it meant to him. He said a garden was one of the few things in the prison that one could control, to plant the seed, watch it grow, tend it, harvest it, or for the simple but enduring satisfaction. The sense of being the custodian of this small patch of earth offered a small taste of freedom. A wish is a desire, often what we know is unlikely. Gardens are such places. They're built wishes, 
hope made material. Garden, though, is a verb, though, as well as a noun. It's an activity as well as a place. And the activity can carry equal and sometimes greater meaning. Defiant gardens are the product of defiant gardening as well, and the defiant gardening and explicit actions. Defiant gardens emphasize work's broader meaning, that it's productive, a way to keep your mind busy. In fact, something literally to do. Mrs. Arima here working in her garden in the Jerome relocation camp uh, in Arkansas, or this drawing from Captain G.D.H. Ross, group Captain G.D.H. Ross, a, Japanese, a, a British prisoner of the Japanese in Indonesia in World War II from a remarkable sketchbook kind of showing the gardens that were created there. In the lunch ghetto, Roman Kent, who I mentioned earlier, came to the gradual realization that despite the heavy work, he actually looked forward to working in the garden. At the Poston camp here in the American West, beautiful garden you see here, uh, Mr. Uh, Hanaway Inouye said about the hard work that individuals engaged there, he said, well, we were Japanese after all, so no one spent lazy days. Um, has anyone seen the film Green Fingers? Anybody? You can rent it. I recommend it. It's a British film. Uh, Green Fingers tells the true story of a group of prisoners in an experimental garden program in Britain that, um, well, like, they, that part's true. Then there's a love story that's not true. <laughs> but that, that part's true. Should, there was an experimental garden program in Britain. They made gardens. Uh, and then they decided to, to make an entry into the Chelsea Flower Show. They entered the Chelsea Flower Show and won and got to meet the queen. That is, in fact, all true. Okay? And they've kind of done this now several times. Uh, this is actually their entry from 2004 called The Garden of Hope. And you see literally this kind of derelict landscape being transformed into this garden. Gardens are beautiful. Thus in war, the antithesis of the beautiful, the common garden, might become the highest art. This is in the First World War, this French soldier kind of beautifully with his trowel kind of laying out this border. And I love the kind of arc of his mustache, you know, compared to the kind of arc of what he's doing with the trowel. The garden's calm and security is only a respite from war's terror. But a garden can be a time when we imagine the kind of ugliness of war being replaced by the beauty of creation. Behind the lines in the First World War, the British lines, was the exceptional garden of the Talbot House. The Talbot House functioned uh, much like an American USO. USO actually doesn't begin until the Second World War. Um, but this was a place for soldiers to go. And this place is still there. And you enter it. And as you walk through this building, you go through a little <coughs> conservatory. And you go through the back door. On that door, there is a sign that is still there. And the sign says, come into the garden and forget about the war. It was a laudable aspiration. The house and its garden were a relief site, a respite, and perhaps an antidote to shell shock. Or here again in the First World War, this soldier painting the kind of trees on the side of his hut. Gerda Klein, and the, some of these individuals I'm talking about, these are not the pictures of those individuals, but of the time, was 18 in 1942 and spent the next three years being shuffled from work camp to concentration camps. In her final camp, she describes a place where there were 2,000 young women who were slave laborers at a factory. And every morning, they would go from the barracks to the factory in kind of lockstep. And as they walked, they walked by the commandant's garden which was a rose garden. And you knew if they just kind of went over and wanted to smell something or pick something, that literally they would have been shot and killed. She describes the fact how one morning on their daily march, a crocus had broken through the concrete and was sprouting. And the 2,000 young women just kind of marched like that around the crocus, silently not stepping on it. Okay? Art in all its forms, visual, musical, literary, was not a luxury or a frill, but it's an imperative and perhaps even a necessity. Okay. Lastly, as I'm talking, we know, of course, that war rages. And gardens, though, are being created. It has always been so. So I have three final examples from three wars. I, uh, after I wrote the book, I received this photo and letter from the man you see here, Bill Beardall, who was a uh, living now in North Carolina, but in 1970, was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. 
And he sent me this picture of his garden that you see there, the one little banana tree, and it's kind of little thing, tiny little things there. He wrote to me, he said he planted this area outside his roof. He said, it had a calming effect on me. After a long day of flying missions in the i area, to see a little green growing in my doorway. He then added, it was small, but it was my oasis. Many a day or late evening, I'd sit by my, quote, patio, drink a cocktail, and enjoy the setting of the sun in the west. I could almost block out the medevac choppers going out and the sound of artillery in the distance. I've never forgotten much about that war and never my oasis. Thank you for reminding me that even one small little garden can create a sense of peace and hope in the midst of war and a warrior's heart. The picture you're looking at here is in 2004 in Iraq, Warrant Officer Brooke Turner, who you see here, had his wife send him grass seed to Iraq. Uh, he missed the green of Hawaii, where he was stationed, and also the green of Oregon, his native Oregon, where he grew up. And he described the fact that usually after work, uh, usually after work back home, he would water the backyard and listen to the radio and walk in the grass barefoot. And he said if he planted grass in some way, it might kind of remind him of that. So actually, he got grass seed, planted the grass seed. This is in the middle of the desert. Of course, the grass seed was eaten entirely by the ants. But he was undeterred, and I don't know the answer to this. Somehow he acquired strips of sod. Okay, we can't get armor for vehicles for soldiers, but he got sod. <laughs> okay. okay, which as you see here, he's trimming with a scissor to kind of mimic his own foot, you know, haircut. <clears throat> uh, you're looking here at Sergeants Justin Wansack and Sergeant Carl Quam of the 141st Engineer Combat Battalion of the North Dakota National Guard when they were stationed near to Crete. Uh, when I asked Sergeant Quam of, of both of them about their garden, Sergeant Quam wrote, he said, we were missing home, farming, and the joy of growing something. They actually are farmers. So they had seed donated from home, and they learned, it, they planted stuff, it didn't work, so they learned techniques from local Iraqi gardeners, and then they engaged in what Sergeant Quam called garden time. That's his term, which he called the time in the evening returning from perilous combat patrol missions, the temperature 140 degrees. He said it was good therapy to relax after a day of dodging roadside bombs. It was a release, a time to put our minds off what was happening. For that little time in the evening, things seemed right, they seemed real. Lastly, Sarajevo was once a city renowned for the peaceful relationships amongst its different ethnic and religious communities. But between 1992 and 1995, 10,000 Sarajevans were killed and 50,000 wounded. In the year 2000, the American Friends Service Committee established a gardening project in Bosnia and Herzegovina directed by a Sarajevan native, a man called, named Dvorin, who was actually a math teacher, had never gardened before. The gardens, these are community gardens, and there's a whole series of them now in Sarajevo, have multiple objectives. They provide, in fact, food for people, but also work therapy and education. But their symbolic presence is powerful because these gardens are created, many of them, in former minefields and killing grounds. But critically, it is also a project in reconciliation and re-socialization. You have to apply to join a garden. And there are two conditions. One, you have to be poor enough that you need the produce, and hopefully you can grow some more and sell it at the market. And secondly, each garden must have a multi-ethnic constituency. It must have Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. Okay. In these places, the Boren says, we are all gardeners, not these individuals. Working in the garden, he says, people, it gives them time to forget. It's not a place to think about things. Gardens mirror a paradox of garden meaning. They operate at both ends of the spectrum of time. Gardens are planted for the future, they're hopeful, they're planted wishes, but they also harken back to a more peaceful time, an actual or idealized past. Uh, the Polish architect Jerzy Sultan was a men member of uh, the, Con the International Congress of Modern Architects, which was the founding collaborative of modern architects in the 1930s. In the 1930s, when the continent was in the grip of the rise of fascism, Sultan reports that this group had a saying. Their saying was, how can one think about roses when the forests are burning? And they then answered their own question. 
And their answer was, how can one not plant roses when the forests are burning? Gardens always asked us that most elementary question. For the forests are always burning, and we always both need and want to plant roses. Thank you. professors lectures before and my reaction has been anything from deep sleep to <laughs> anger to other things and I got to say this is probably the most moving uh, lecture that I've ever heard so thank you for that I think we have time for some questions yeah, I glad the answer oh. yeah no if there's any questions I will yes sir Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the point, points is I think all gardens have a kind of germ of kind of defiance in them, even your kind of own kind of residential garden. I chose, in looking at gardens during wartime, not to look at gardens on the home front. Um, Victory Gardens are gar gardens built on the home front, but one, as you see here, either at or near the kind of actual battlefield. Um, but there's, a, there's actually been kind of wonderful histories of Victory Gardens and a kind of great habit that we still need, need to, uh, if you will, cultivate. Uh, during the Second World War, virtually every major park in the United States, the land was torn up for victory gardens in cities all across the country, mm -hmm. and Britain as well. Mm -hmm. Yes? In the, uh, in the work that you did for this, Kenny, during these war times, the prisoner of war camps, the uh, camps, you talk about gardens as a particular art form, if you will, that people use for so much. Were there other Oh, absolutely. What I say about gardens here, I think is, much of it I think is true for other arts. I could, if, if I was a, a music historian or an art historian, I could equally say many of the same things about the role that music played in people's minds, or the role that art would play in people's minds, or the role that poetry would play in people's lives. There is a difference, though. And the key difference is you can't have, despite the children's story, you can't have a secret garden. It's like, you, know, you, you can write a poem in your head. You can even, you know, like scratch, you know, pictures in the sand. But a garden, you needed at least the kind of tacit permission of whomever was imprisoning you or guarding you or watching you and so on. And that, that was true in all of these circumstances up to a certain period of time. So, for example, in the internment camps in this country, our government, after a while, actually encouraged the practice and ironically took some pride in it. Like, oh, look how nice the camps are. Which they didn't make them nice, the individuals there make them nice. Uh, in the ghettos, only for a kind of certain period, largely in the kind of early life in the ghetto, the garden kind of allowed it, then at a certain point, people were literally being exterminated. Um, but they have a public presence and statement, and I think it's critical because not everyone is a gardener, cares about gardening, so on, but everyone gets to see the acts of others. Um, so even if you're not the one who's doing it, you, uh, you see that, you admire it, you kind of are aware of what's going on uh, kind of around you. The only secret ones I know of were, were uh, 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 Japanese POW camps where people were making little roof gardens in the crevices. But otherwise, it, but, but I think that that can do it equally for other artists. Yes. Um, do you think that in the ghettos, um, the garden is also a form of establishing status? Um, I know, like in most of our societies today, we establish status by what we buy or what we have or what kind of um, aesthetic value um, our possessions are. Do you think that the gardens represent? Actually, I don't think that. I, I think you know the, there was a certain status in all of these situations of if you were a good gardener. I eat, did you get did you grow more food? Literally, because most of these were food. so there was a there is a kind of status of you you'd be known as that you really knew what you were doing, um, and others didn't. Uh, there's a very interesting circumstance in um, in World War II in the Philippines and in Hong Kong when, um, when the war happened. Whole, not just soldiers, but uh, but families were imprisoned 
those who've been part of the kind of British and colonial, largely British and American kind of colonial enterprise, and whole families and groups were interned for during the wartime under horrific and horrible uh, conditions. And the gardeners in most of those situations ended up being uh, the women, the kind of wives, the men were generally kept in a kind of separate camp. And these were women who, before the war, had literally, you know, hot and cold running servants. You know, and people did everything for them, but they proved to be amazingly resourceful and imaginative and kind of learning literally local practices. And there was certainly some prestige kind of in there, but not the kind of status of, you know, like, I got the big one on the corner and mine's more elaborate. Um, although, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Interesting question. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the research process of you when you started how long you took and did you ever take a break while you were doing it? Those are two really good questions. Um, first off, I wrote it, I, as I said, this was inspired by that single stereo photograph. I found this photograph, I wish I remembered where, I don't remember where, but he has a way to get the picture. You know, I collect stuff. You know, you're an antique stuff. You know, I don't remember where I got it. But I got it, and I knew it was a, it sat on my shelf. You know, you stick like rocks and shells and things like that. It sat on my shelf for years, and I knew it was important. Then it kind of slowly gestated, and I started collecting things of other difficult gardens in difficult places and wartime and so on. And then about now, about a dozen years ago, I wrote a brief article with the same title about the basic idea. Not very much research, but a brief article. And then that festered. I actually wrote another book in the meantime. When I decided to finally kind of direct, address this more seriously, decided to look at gardens during wartime. Um, and I was looking at uh, the ones I'd written about in that article, the First World War, the ghettos, and the internment camps, those three, uh, originally. And uh, so the research was undertaken. I spent the summer at the Imperial War Museum in London, which is a great archive of military history, especially First World War history, for the First World War stuff. I was also at archives in France and Belgium. I thought, of, even though none of these exist, I thought it was imperative for me to go to the actual places. So I've spent days and weeks on the Western Front, uh, parts I haven't talked about here, the kind of trenches and cemeteries of the millions that, that died there, uh, to get a sense of, literally, the, that sense of being in, a, in those, those places. Um, for the ghettos, I did research at the, what's called the Eater Scientific Institute in New York, at Steven Spielberg Shoah Holocaust Archives in Los Angeles, at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and, and archives in Warsaw and in Israel uh, as well. Um, for um, the, the internment camps, I was, in some ways, that was the one area where some previous research had been done some of my former students of mine uh, who now work for the National Park Service. Um, the other stuff, there was nothing. You'd go to a catalog of photographs and look up garden, nothing. So you start looking under other things, agriculture, potatoes. I mean, just, you know, you start to look at it. I also interviewed people where possible. Um, mostly, I mean, these are obviously anyone who did any of these, is, you know, either most of those people are no longer alive, but I had the kind of great opportunity to kind of interview uh, certain individuals, and I got a surprising amount of material on the web. Um, and I say that because certain archives now have put most of the, some of their materials on the web, particularly photographs. So I would, for example, one archive in Israel that's an entire photographic archive on the web, so I could do all that stuff there. Then I could go to the place and get the stuff that wasn't on the web, the kind of text and talk to people, and so on. Um, ben, your second question was, did it get to me? Um, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> okay, um, and I did these actually in almost chronological order. So I spent months, literally, um, reading memoirs and diaries of the First World War, literally with the papers in hand of the individual who wrote them, and knowing how and how and where that person died, because most of these people did not survive. Uh, and you read lots of this, and it's it's horrible. And so I spent a similar period reading diaries and memoirs of the ghetto, um, and then spending time in uh, in the ghetto. Um, and at a certain point, it literally did get. I mean, you know, my wife said, "You got to stop." Literally, I mean, it was getting. It was, I was being a little bit obsessed with it and telling stories. And the way I write, I write things and I read them out loud. And I was reading things out loud to my wife, and I'm crying. 
I'm crying at my own words, let alone the words of somebody else. You know, so actually we took a month off, went to Italy, Croatia, had a great time. <laughs> it really, so, but it really, it, it was not easy, uh, but I think the, um, I think that's, it, I think it was something we kind of had to kind of get into. You know, and I kind of admired you know, those who make, you know, the study of some of these things historically, their life's work. It's, it's not easy psychologically. On the other hand, there was these amazingly, you know, horrific things and these kind of amazingly hopeful tales often. And then I've actually set up defiantgardens.com as of two weeks ago, uh, a website where I'm collecting the stories that have come to me since I, I wrote the book. So even in this audience, if anybody kind of knows of anything or anything, like this guy from Vietnam, I just got that like last month. He's seen the book and sent me this. So uh, it has have an interesting, if you will, a kind of afterlife, which is obviously very gratifying. Thank you, folks. Oh, wait, wait, Bob, one question. One more. One point. My illustrious colleague. Professor Elwood, I believe, uh, designed the U.S. military cemetery in France. I was told that earlier today. So it's kind of fitting that what you're talking about. Yeah, but that's, no, did you hear that? <coughs> Professor Elwood designed it at the First World War, yeah, first U.S. World military World. cemetery in France. Um, if you go abroad, by the way, you don't have to go abroad. You can go to veteran cemeteries in this country. Um, but sites on the Western Front, Normandy, other sites, are some of the most powerful places you can go. I recommend that. One more thing before go we go. Um, Jen Rall, who is the, the new president of the SSLA, the Student Society of Landscape Architects, has something to present to <laughs> On behalf of SSLA and the PHLR lecture series, we're proud to present you with a PHLR lecture series. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why is it? Oh, he does look like a gangster. I know. You know? Oh, and that's oh, the back. By the way, if you don't know his t-shirts, which I just I had seen the front, but I hadn't seen the back. The back is his kind of wonderful list of his accomplishments, which is very nice. Another thing that Joffrey did not do enough research on, because Elwood Drive was the first head of landscape architecture at Iowa State campus, and S.A. Beach was the head of horticulture, which is on the other side of Ryan Gardens. And then it just went out the window when they changed it to the non-discriminatory university pool. Thank you, folks. Thank you.